All right, welcome to uh, parallel session B, uh, which is on the topic of fault torrent quantum computation. My name is David Poulain. I'll be chairing this session. Uh, so our first talk is by Earl Campbell and Mark Howard, and it's entitled Unifying Gate Synthesis in Magic State Distillation. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizing uh, committee and the program committee for allowing me to speak here today. So I'm going to be talking about work in collaboration with Mark Howard. We're both based in Sheffield. And this is a session on fault tolerant quantum computing. And within that topic, you could kind of pull out certain distinct subtopics, one of which is gate synthesis, and one of which is magic state distillation. And typically, these are both thought of as separate topics. And what I'm going to describe to you today is a framework for understanding certain types of gate synthesis and certain types of magic state distillation at the same time within the same framework, and also offering you some new protocols that can improve uh, resource costs. So I want to start off by giving you an overview of kind of what I might suggest is the standard picture or one of the standard pictures of how you can perform fault tolerant quantum computing. So in the first step, you just simply build a quantum memory with reliable Clifford gates. So obviously that's quite a significant challenge, but for the purpose of this talk, we're going to assume that that is dealt with. So for example, using the surface code or a 2D color code or something like that. But the Clifford gates aren't enough to give you universal quantum computing, so you need to do something else. So in the second step, you might have some clever means of distilling magic states. So the T magic state is that state there. And once you've got such a state, you can go to the third step and perform state injection, which is basically a teleportation trick that takes one copy of the T state, does some Clifford operations and measurements, and deterministically gives you the T gate. Now, the Clifford group plus the T gate is known to be universal. So that tells us that any algorithm that you care to um, name, you can decompose into some sequence of Clifford plus T gates, which is the process that we call synthesis. And um, ideally, you want to have the minimal number of gates in your circuit. So that's kind of a, a standard picture. You'll hear later on from Hector about color codes and 3D color codes and other ideas. But this is a, a very popular one. And uh, we had this notion of T-gate teleportation in the previous slides. It's been known for quite a long time that you can actually perform more sophisticated teleportation, provided some other more exotic magic state. So say if you've got some magic state that I'll call the U state, which is just U applied to the plus state, then assuming certain conditions on U, then you can perform some control knots, make some measurements, possibly some Clifford correction, but essentially all things in the Clifford group, and you deterministically get the gate U. So what are the conditions on this? Well, the gate U has to belong to the third level of the Clifford hierarchy. Today, we're going to keep things simple and just think about the diagonal gates in the third level of Clifford hierarchy. So the Clifford hierarchy is the set of, the, the set of unitaries that conjugate the Pauli group to the Clifford group. And uh, if that's not sufficient for you, what we're going to see are lots of examples. So you should learn what it is by example. So this suggests another paradigm for approaching fault tolerant computing, which is similar to the standard one. But in the second step, instead of making T states, we'd make these more sophisticated states and then deterministically inject those instead. And then in the fourth step, we still need to do some synthesis because U alone is not uh, sufficient to give you any computation that you want. You still need to um, combine it with some other gates that aren't diagonal. But the hope is that maybe it costs more to create the magic state in step two, but you do less synthesis in step four. And overall, maybe you come out as kind of more resource efficient. So we know how to do many of these different steps, but we don't really have a particularly eff effective means of preparing these states. And that's going to be the topic of this talk. I'm going to, talk to you, tell you about how to um, prepare these exotic magic states. So we'll break the talk up into four sections. I'm going to cover, uh, I'm going to spend quite a lot of time actually covering the background ideas, gate synthesis, magic state distillation, and fixing our notation. And then I'll tell you how we make these states. And then I'll tell you a bit about the resource comparison, and I'll argue that for one particular metric, you see about a factor three improvement in resource costs. And then at the end, I want to give you a little bit of kind of bonus results. So these are results that might interest you if you're interested in gate synthesis, but maybe not state preparation. So these are results that kind of uh, point towards better protocols for um, compressing these circuits. OK, so gate synthesis. So the Clifford group, uh, it was covered a bit earlier today already. So it's the group generated by, say, Hadamard, S-gate, and control not gate. The important thing about the Clifford group is that it conjugates Pauli operators to Pauli operators. And I've illustrated that there for the Hadamard gate. But it's not a universal gate set. In fact, we can efficiently simulate it. So we want to add the T-gate. 
So the T-gate and the Clifford group, as I mentioned earlier, is a universal gate set. And the T-gate is down there at the bottom. It's just a phase gate. In fact, if I square T, I get the S gate. So you might think of it as a square root of that gate. Now, Clifford group operations in, say, the Toric code or a 2D color code are fairly straightforward. So we might say that they have some unit cost. But the T-gate is much, much harder to implement because you have to use things like magic state distillation in order to get it in the first place. So if you do some calculations, assuming certain things, for instance, that you're using the surface code, then what you find is that the cost of a T-gate is somewhere between, say, 200 and 500 times as much as a, any operation in the Clifford group. To, so to a very good approximation, all we're really interested in is counting T-gates. That's all we really care about is the T-gate cost. So let's take some circuit. Um, this is just an, a circuit I made up, but let's think of it as a generic circuit. And uh, we've got a bunch of Clifford group op operations we know how to implement. And in the standard paradigm, we would say, well, there's 13 of these. So somewhere else in my computer, I have a factory that makes 13 T-states. But our paradigm, we're thinking about something slightly different, where we're breaking it up into sub-circuits. So here, we're breaking things up into sub-circuits that don't have Hadamard gates. So of course, any algorithm can be broken up into bits that have only Hadamards and bits that don't have any Hadamards. And this particular set of gates, this group of gates, T plus um, S and control not, has been studied extensively in these papers. And in the following slides, I'm going to give you lots of results, not tell you where they came from. They all came from these papers. OK, so what's in, what, the first important thing that we want to know about these sub-circuits is that they can always be broken up. So each one of these sub-circuits, let's say Q, can be broken up into a part F and a part U. And I've given you an example at the bottom for the bottom left-hand um, sub-circuit. So the first part F, if you can see, is just uh, made of control not gates. And then the part U has all the gates, but it's been arranged in such a way that there's no permutation of the computational basis. So what you find is that the first part is control not, and the second part, actually, has been shown, always is part of this set, the di this group, the diagonal gates in the third level of the Clifford hierarchy. Right? So that, that's, remember from a few slides back, those are the unit trees that we know how to deterministically inject, provided that we've got the right magic state. So that immediately tells us that for any algorithm, we can always break it up in such a way. And then the U's that we have here, if we consider that all we need to do to implement this circuit is to prepare these magic states, U1, U2, U3, for example. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about this uh, group of gates used by example. So throughout, when I think about how the control not gate acts, so the control not gate adds the value of the control to the target, and we're going to denote this with, uh, denote this with addition modulo 2 arithmetic. And the T gate gives you, when it acts on some computational basis state, it gives you some phase here. So S is a Clifford operation. And if we have M multiples of S, we see that we pick up a phase, which is 2M plus 1 times X. Right? So all we really care about, actually, is how many T gates we've used. And so we see that if this exponent here was something that was an even number, then it would be a Clifford operation. And if it was an odd number, then I could always find some M to get that odd number using only one instance of the T gate. So in many slides, actually, I'm only going to deal with functions that have exponents where this is just 1 or 2 or something, just to keep things much simpler. Okay? So if we combine C naughts and T gates, then what we find is that in the middle of the circuit, you're in this state. And so when you apply a T gate to the second qubit, you pick up a phase, which is x1, o plus x2. Okay? So let's go to start composing these things together. So we start adding some other T gates. And for this circuit, you get uh, the same thing we had the line above, plus we get a phase from this, and we get a phase from this. And so we have this exponent here. And the thing to notice is that it has, it's basically a linear sum, but with a mixture of two different types of arithmetic, standard arithmetic and modular two arithmetic. And essentially, that characterizes everything that is in this group, the diagonal group of um, the diagonal subgroup of the third level of the Griffith hierarchy. Awfully long name. Um, you go to something even more complicated. So you have, say, lots, some arbitrary thing full of uh, control not circuits. You apply lots of T gates. You invert it. Then you find that the action of the control not circuit will always permute the computational basis states in such a way that you can think about it as being multiplied by some matrix that's invertible, some binary matrix. That's what control not circuits do. And so 
if we run this whole circuit, we again get omega with some exponent here, right? And this is just compact notation for what you were seeing before, right? So the addition modulo 2 comes in because when I multiply j by x, I do it modulo 2 arithmetic. But then these vertical lines show the weight function, and I do that with uh, standard arithmetic. OK, so here's an example. I have j. I multiply it by binary vector. I get something else. I work out the weight, and I get some function. But the number of variables is equal to the number of terms. And in general, there might be many more terms than there are variables. But it turns out that you can also do that in what's called t depth 1. Selinger coined that term by just setting some of the ancillas to the zero state. And that corresponds exactly to basically missing some rows off this matrix J. So here we have actually a function that has three terms, so it will require three T gates, and only two variables, so a two qubit circuit. And that essentially characterizes everything inside this diagonal group. OK? So we need a notion of Clifford equivalence. If two unit trees are Clifford equivalent, they both have functions, say f and g, that correspond to them. And I'm just going to use squiggle c to mean that there exists some Clifford that tells us these two functions are equivalent. And um, often I'm going to use a notation to say, well, I've got some function, and I can always represent it as this matrix A transpose. right? And remember that the number of terms here corresponds to the number of T gates, which is also equal to the number of columns here. So you can just read off the T count cost, the T count of a circuit. And I'm going to use this notation tau u to tell me what the optimal synthesis cost is for the optimal A. So that's everything that I'm going to tell you about gate synthesis. I've only dealt with one particular gate synthesis problem. This, um, th there are many other interesting ones. Many of the experts in the world are in this room today. But um, we won't say any more about them right now. Now I'm going to tell you about magic state distillation. So uh, this is the question of how you prepare high fidelity T states given only low fidelity ones to start off with. And there are numerous protocols for how to do this. But today, I'm really going to focus on the Bravi Ha protocol, which is arguably one of the most practical and uh, efficient ones. So the Bravi Ha protocol takes in some batch of uh, states with an error rate epsilon and output states with an error rate epsilon squared. And, uh, but when it does so, it has few outputs and inputs roughly by a factor of a three. So that's roughly what its performance is. If you want to get more error suppression, you just have to repeat it many, many times. You have to concatenate this protocol. And the, the key, the really key mathematical concept in understanding their codes, uh, sorry, their protocols, is this idea of triorthogonal matrices. So a triorthogonal matrix is some matrix, G, which is broken up into subblocks. And the top block, if you think about these actually correspond to quantum codes. And the top block is telling you something about the logical operators for the code. And this is telling you about the uh, x stabilizers of the code, so the checks in some sense. And here we have what the condition of triorthogonality is in our notation. So if you've actually uh, read the Bravi Ha paper, then you will not recognize this as being the condition for triorthogonality at all. But for our purposes, it's uh, much easier to just give it to you in our notation. And that's simply that when I um, multiply these matrices by binary vectors x and y, the y and work it out and evaluate the weights up to Clifford's, then all of the y variables disappear. Right? Um, this is just telling you that you don't leave the code space, basically. And uh, specifically, also, you get the function x1 plus x2, blah, 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 up to xk. OK? So here's the actual protocol. So you have some bunch of qubits that you might think about as being logical qubits that end up with u applied to them afterwards. And you have some check qubits that correspond to the rows of this matrix x. And then you have some other um, ancilla that you need to make this unitary work, similar to in the gate synthesis case. And those are set to 0. You perform some encoder circuit which is just the C0, any C0 circuit that acts as follows. And there will always be such a one. And uh, then you apply T gates everywhere. You inverse. Maybe you have to do a Clifford correction. And then you measure here. Now, provided there was no noise on these T gates, which are performed by ejection from noisy states, you'll get all plus one outcomes here. But if there is noise here, and you've designed your code well, then you'll see minus one outcomes here, in which case you just throw everything away and start again. And so it is a post-selective strategy, but the probability apply, um, approaches 1 as epsilon goes to 0. Okay? And uh, so they prove that um, this protocol will work, provided this matrix G is triorthogonal. And then they give examples of such triorthogonal matrices. So what I'm going to present to you today is going to be a generalization of this. Okay. So our protocols, we're calling them scintillation protocols. And the idea is we call it that because you're performing synthesis and distillation in a single step. 
And I also want to remind you of kind of what the big picture is here. What we're trying to do instead of the more standard picture where you're trying to distill in your factory good T states and then kind of shipping those off into the algorithm to apply a single T gate is that inside your factory you make some large complex magic state, you ship it off and then you dump it in your algorithm and it's kind of the analogy here is building houses by flat pack. You're building huge kind of prefabricated chunks of algorithm off site and the hope is that that's easier to do off site than on site. Okay, and this is our protocol. The slide, I've set it up in such a way that it'll look very reminiscent to you because it's essentially the same slide as the one I showed you for the Bravi-Ha protocol. Um, it's also very similar to the uh, protocols for gate synthesis. Again, we just have some unitary that is a C0 circuit that implements uh, this transformation given some matrix G broken up into K and S. But we need certain conditions on what K and S have to, K and S have to satisfy. And so that's one of our main results, that if you want to distill the state U, then you can do so provided that these matrices K and S satisfy the condition that when you multiply them by some binary vector, take the weight, you get this function. And the function is just the thing in the exponent, right? So provided you have those conditions, then you have a distillation protocol. And you'll also see that epsilon goes to epsilon rise to the power of D, where D is some distance that depends on the matrix S. It's basically just the distance of the, the quantum code that corresponds to these matrices. So within this framework, you have several examples. So Bravi half fits in very neatly. U is just many copies of the T state that you're trying to get. And then when you evaluate this function, you just have x1 plus x2 plus blah, 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 up to xk, which is just the functional representation of many T gates. But as I've alluded to a few times, you can think about these encoding circuits as taking you into some quantum code. And uh, in that picture then, when you apply the T gates, what you're doing is performing a transversal gate. So you apply lots of T gates everywhere, and then you get some logical operation which is non-Clifford. And uh, there are examples of codes, for example, the 3D color codes, where you have transversal T gates. And so this also offers a new perspective on how to uh, prove transversality in these codes. Uh, in particular, so I have a little blog post about this. It's kind of like a spin-off from the paper where I talk about the correspondence between triorthogonality and uh, kind of strange color codes where you get applying lots of T gates and you get a, a Toffley gate out effectively. Um, and this is also related to work by uh, Alex Kubeka and co. So that's fantastic, but how do we find good K and S? I've told you that if I've got good K and S that satisfy these criteria, then I've got a good protocol, but what are the K and S? Well, let's look at an example. I'm going to start off with a simple example, which applies to any circuit which is built up of CCZ gates. So a control control Z gate. And uh, it doesn't have to be a single one. It can be many, uh, many of these things combined together. And this is an important class of circuits because it's closely related to Toffley. If you can put Hadamard's either side, you get a Toffley gate. The Toffley gate is the uh, dominant resource cost in Shaw's algorithm and many other algorithms that have huge chunks of reversible logic in them. So if you can find big resource savings for uh, reversible logic circuits, then you've done something valuable. Um, so maybe you can't quite see how this kind of phase polynomial, uh, this mixture of standard and modular two arithmetic gives you a control control Z gate. And here's an example of why, because um, there's this identity between addition modular two arithmetic and uh, kind of a cubic polynomial. And you can see that this thing here will only take, only take the value one if all of the variables are equal to one, which is exactly what a control control Z gate does. It only gives you a phase if all of the variables are set to one. Okay, so this is how we build our matrix G. It's very, very simple. Um, we take whatever the A matrix is. This is the matrix that tells you how to do gate synthesis. And we just pad it with one extra column and one extra row. So the, extra, um, the extra row here is giving us the protection against noise. And uh, this is needed based on the assumption that this thing has odd width. And you can show in just a few lines, and I can tell you more about this if there's more time at the end, that uh, assuming this, then you can prove that assuming that A transpose X gives you the function as it should do, then you have the condition that you need to satisfy for this scintillation protocol to work. But remarkably, if you look here, the cost is again related to just the width of this matrix. And it's just the T count plus one. So you might have a circuit that you know how to perform using 1,000 uh, T gates. And for 1,001 T gates, you can implement the circuit, but get quadratic noise suppression. So you're effectively getting quadratic noise suppression for free. 
So that's great. Uh, it's an important subclass, but it's not all of the gates that we wanted to show that we could prepare the magic states for. It's a more general class. But to go to the more general class, we're going to build more complicated G matrices. As you can see, we're just kind of like plugging things together. So to make things a little bit easier on the eyes, from here on in, I'm going to switch to Duplo notation. So um, this is a matrix A that has to satisfy the conditions throughout that we've said it must satisfy. But we're also going to have other matrices that we're going to use to slot together. For instance, the matrix B. And the only condition on the matrix B is that B, B transpose has got to be equal to A, A transpose mod 2. But you can satisfy that condition and have varying width matrices. And you want to have the smallest one. So see, this brick's actually smaller. So how do I find the smallest B matrix? So at this point, when we were working through the project, I thought, maybe Google knows. So I just type, I think, how would I phrase this question? Maybe matrix factorization over GF2. Type it into Google. One of the first hits is a paper from 1975, not cited by many people, but it solved exactly this problem. And it was a very well-written paper. I read it, and I was able to implement the code within a couple of days. So um, that tells us that there is an effective and efficient way of finding the smallest B matrix. And the number of columns corresponding to that matrix we're just going to call mu u from now on. And this algorithm, due to Lempel, is going to crop up later on again. It's very important. Um, so mu is 0 for CCZ circuits. That's an important class. But actually, we have a proof that mu for random circuits is going to be much, much smaller than tau. Right? So this B matrix is going to be tiny. Specifically, tau can grow um, quadratically, whereas mu can grow at most linearly. And if you look at a random circuit, they'll get close to saturating those bounds. And if you take a large enough circuit, then the ratio between these two things will basically be 0. So for large random circuits, mu is 0. For CCZ circuits, mu is 0. So um, this is a small matrix. We also have some constant width matrix, which I won't say too much about because it's constant width. It doesn't really influence the resource cost that much. So given those building blocks, we can quite simply slot them together and get our G matrix. So the important thing here is the width of this object. So it has tau width, two lots of mu, plus some constant stuff. Now, the red block that I hadn't introduced here corresponds to the S matrix, which is responsible for the quadratic error suppression. And that has a, a, just a constant number of rows. The important thing here is that if I then add in this extra thing that we know, that often actually mu is going to be much, much less than tau, then what we see is that this resource cost for large circuits is basically going to be equal to just tau. Right? And that's just the T count, the scintillation cost. So what we see is that even in this more complicated scenario uh, where we don't have pure CCZ circuits, approximately the scintillation cost is equal to the synthesis cost. So I want to keep kind of drilling home this message that what you're seeing is you get a quadratic error suppression for free compared to performing gate synthesis in the unitary fashion. That's the proviso here. So when I say synthesis cost, I'm saying synthesis, assuming that you perform synthesis unitarily. And Mark will actually pick up on this point today as well. Um, so maybe you're not happy with Duplo notation and you want to see a binary matrix representation. There it is. I've also assumed that A and B have even width. And if they don't, then you can just use some other construction. There's an exhaustive table of constructions in the long paper. Um, so now let's do a resource comparison. So here's a side-by-side -side analysis of our kind of mindset versus what you might call the standard paradigm. So we're just saying we want to implement the gate, implement the gate U in a single scintillation step, possibly with some precursor rounds of Brabiha. And so this is the resource cost from the previous slide. If you want to do it in the, if you want to do something equivalent, if you want to do a like-by-like -like analysis, we've got to compare our approach against some gate synthesis-based approach where you also get quadratic error suppression. So let's say one round of Brabiha plus gate synthesis. So a two-step distill and synthesize protocol. So to synthesize the circuit, you need tau UT states. But then to distill those states, you need roughly three times as many. So again, what we see is now if we're thinking in terms of um, fixed target error rates and what the resource cost is, if mu is small, you've got about a factor three improvement. So to me, I think that's important progress. We want to try and reduce the resource overhead in fault-tolerant quantum computing as much as we can. And uh, reductions like these are quite hard to come by. Maybe you're not so interested in the details of uh, resource analysis, but you like to learn things about the structure of fault-tolerant protocols. In which case, I think there's something for you here as well, because we've done this kind of unification that I promised earlier, which is that all of these protocols, our protocol, Brabiha, Gates, Synthesis, could all be understood in this Duplo notation, right? So 
Ravi Ha is actually the same, exactly the same matrix construction as we have, but just with A and B set to be the identity. And gate synthesis is just the A matrix sat on its own without this extra row at the bottom that is doing the error suppression. Um, so I think it's a nice framework for understanding this whole class of protocols. So let's kind of go into a bit more detail of a specific example. TOF hash, which corresponds to two control, control Z gates and crops up in Shaw's algorithm. Uh, you know you can do CCZ with 70 gates unitarily, so you might think this costs 14, but there are some cancellations, so it's more like 11. If you chuck Bavi Har cost on top, it's three times that. Whereas for us, we only have to pay one more T gate, so it costs 12, and of course 12 is less than 33. So for this example, you do quite well. But this is kind of very rough resource estimate, and uh, you might say, ah, but there's a finite success probability, and both of them suppress noise quadratically, but maybe it's not exactly the same amount. So let's look at the actual specifics for uh, what the resource cost is. So at the bottom of the slide here, you've got some copy-pasted Mathematica script. So what this Mathematica script does is it takes a matrix A, it builds the matrix G, that is the scintillation matrix, it outputs the success probability, the error out, and then it also runs various checks um, which should all come out true, unless there's been a mistake in either the codes or the theorems, and so far they always come out true, which is a relief. Um, so now you can take this analysis, you can combine it with the possibility of additional precursor rounds of Bravi-Ha, and then you get our dots along the bottom here. So these are the hollow dots. So up here is the T cost, and this is the target error rate. So this is low error rate, and this is high error rate. And what you see, actually, compared against the standard distill and synthesize approach, is actually a little bit more than this promised factor three improvement. And the reason why it's a little bit more is that the success probability of our protocol, the success probabilities depend on the number of T gates used. And so, because we use fewer T gates, we actually have higher success probability. So everything, every single metric is favorable. Um, if, you're just counting, if you're just counting resources by number of T gates. Okay, so that's the main message for today that I wanted to get across. And with my remaining couple of minutes, I'm going to very quickly tell you about some spin-off ideas. So we wrote this paper, and as we were writing it, we discovered this Lempel factorization method from this 1975 paper very late on, and then realized that actually these ideas, this very neat factorization method, maybe can be used to actually optimize the circuit synthesis cost. So I've kind of swept this under the carpet. I've said, imagine some matrix A that gives you the function when you multiply it by a vector. Um, but there can, in fact, be many such matrices A. And since the cost depends on the width of it, you want the smallest one. So that's a problem. You want to find the smallest A matrix. And this problem was considered in detail and fully characterized, although there was some earlier work that led up to this, um, by Amy and Mosca. And I just want to pause for a moment and tell you that I I think this paper is really amazing and recommend everyone go read it because it completely changed the direction of my research. And I think that half the results that are in these slides wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't read this paper. Um, and from this paper, you can lift, say, two solvers or optimizers for this gate synthesis problem. One of them is the optimal solver, which corresponds to Reed Muller decoding. That's the title of the paper, effectively. And this decoder gives you a promise that if you have an n qubit circuit, it will not require, if you've solved the optimal problem, more than n squared over two T gates. The problem is that this problem is believed to be very, very hard. It's related to a tensor contraction problem. And by just trying to brute force solve it, we found that we can't get past, say, n equals six on a reasonable computer. But you can also lift from the paper a simple solver, which has uh, is a very fast implementation and has an n cubed overhead, but is very far sub from optimal. So we've made some progress. Um, so if we just look at the special case of controlled C unitaries, then we can optimally solve these circuits very quickly with linear cost. And by using this trick and concatenating it n times, you can get another solver that gives you an n squared over 2 promise. Um, and it's also very fast. But it gives you no promise of the optimality. So it's kind of near or quasi-optimal in the sense that the worst case behavior is exactly the same as the optimal behavior. But it's not promised to be optimal. So how do we do this? Well, in both instances, it just corresponds to a relaxation of these problems to this matrix factorization problem that was solved back in 1975. So that's everything that was in the paper. And uh, the analytic proofs that these things will work. We're, under the, uh, we're in the process of developing software. So I'll very quickly show you 
preliminary data that my PhD student sent me this morning. So this is providers under the fact that maybe there needs to be some debugging or something. But what we're seeing here is the light green line going up there is what you might kind of use with the find if you had to run the simple solver. And the bottom line here is what we find with the best variant that we currently have running. But we have several ideas on how to optimize it further. The dashed line is the analytic upper bound. So you can see that for circuits of, fact of about 25 qubits, you're seeing a very large reduction in the T count. This is for random circuits, OK, for randomly selected circuits. So that's everything that I wanted to talk to you about today. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Earl. So we have plenty of time for questions. Zhang Wa. Uh, maybe we can address that question over here in the meantime. Oh, um, hi. I, so in the scintillation protocol, if the, sub air, uh, the success probability is not, I'm sorry, the failure probability is not suppressed by the code distance, if I uh, interpret the failure as a noise, then how can I interpret the whole scheme as an uh, 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 improvement in the fidelity? So if you don't post-select, right. you're saying you don't post-select. Right. It's exactly the same scenario as, so really these are quantum codes, and what we're doing is running them in error detect mode. So you see the error suppressor from epsilon to epsilon to the power of d. And if you uh, run it in error correct modes, then you basically see that it's suppressed by d to the power, like uh, epsilon to the d over 2 instead. right? So all of these things could, could, if you wanted to, be run in error correct mode. The same for the uh, Bravi Hard protocol. Although because they're only distance two, then um, you actually can't correct any errors, so you wouldn't see any error suppression. But then you can always concatenate with something else. Uh, so you could concatenate any of these scintillation protocols with Bravi Ha, and then assuming you do message passing, then you will get some suppression, which is you know roughly the distance of the code divided by two. But I think that to get the extra error suppression, it's worth the finite failure probability, because the failure probability goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. Right? So maybe in the first round, if your error rate is, you know, if your states have uh, you know, epsilon is 1% or 0.1%, then the failure probability will be not negligible. But after you've done one or two rounds of distillation, then epsilon is already down to 10 to the minus 10. You just want to do one more round, then basically failure rate 10 to the minus 10 is nothing. So there's almost nothing to lose from doing it in error detect mode. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. That was a question there. Hi. Um, so this is a very a very stupid question, but I just wanted to clarify one point. Um, because you, you went through a lot of uh, uh, steps that go into your protocol um, and compared back to Bravi Ha, but I wasn't quite clear what element of how you were doing things gave you this factor of three improvement. And could you just turn that back around and do a, uh, you know, distill the standard uh, um, magic states like in Ravi Ha with, with a factor of three improvement oh. over their protocol? That's a, a very good question. Um, so the factor three improvement is because uh, you, maybe if I uh, go back a few slides, it can be clearer. So I said that these matrices B were, say, negligible for certain classes of problems. So they're negligible if it's a CCZ circuit, and they're neg negligible for large random circuits. Now, for Bravi Ha, you're trying to implement a specific circuit, which is many copies of the T-gate. In fact, that's very far from random. It's almost a pathological case. So in that pathological case of trying to implement a circuit which is many copies of the T-gate, 
you're forced to take B exactly equal to A, right? So the matrix has to be the identity. This matrix has to be the identity. And so um, you see no resource saving because you don't see this compression of these matrices in the middle. So um, whilst there are a broad, two large broad classes of circuits where you see a factor three improvement, the case of implementing just T tensor K is uh, you know, one of the pathological cases where you see no improvement. Uh, just quick, quick follow-up on that. Um, do you expect this to work for non-random but non-trivial circuits that you might encounter in an actual algorithm? Well, that's the next phase is benchmarking. So, um, well, first of all, as I also said earlier, it works for CCZ circuits, which make up a large chunk of Shaw's algorithm. So you see the factor three improvement there. Um, and so I guess for the, the we're trying to benchmark against highly structured cases and also random cases. And I have some more data on some highly structured cases, um, but I don't have it on me at the moment. I think what we really want to do when we finish developing the software is to take some circuits and run it against those. Uh, the Duplo notation is brilliant. I love it. You indicated early in your talk that uh, T gates cost several hundred times as much as an H gate. Now, you must have based that on some particular technology. Are you using uh, superconducting loops or what? That's pretty much assuming that you're using the surface code. Surface code with, say, a physical error rate of 0.1% or something like that. Right, so there's uh, some uh, early stuff by Rausendorf, where actually the factor's more like a 1,000 in the regime that we're interested in. And then there's some analysis by Fowler. And then I also have a paper where we look at this kind of full costing, as you might call it. And they all roughly, they all work on slightly different assumptions. But no matter what your set of assumptions, the numbers always crop out roughly in the same area. The reason why the Rausendorf number was more like a 1,000 was because he used the 15 qubit read Muller code rather than the Brabby Haar code. So going from 15 qubit to read Muller, you see about a factor three drop. Um, sorry, going from the 15 qubit to Brabby Haar, you see a factor three drop. So um, basically surface code are the assumptions. All right, so with that, let's thank Earl again. And uh, here's your t-shirt. Oh.